border project funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation on ideas, representation, and legacy, reclaiming black intellectual history in South Africa. And the aim of this project is to really center black intellectual voices that have been overlooked in South Africa's historiography and incorporate their ideas into the discipline's self-conscious awareness. It's really about facilitating a wider and more expansive notion of the context in which ideas of South African black intellectuals were developed and how their responses to issues such as the dispossession of land, labor and ontological domination provide provides an unexplored lens for contemporary analysis. So my presentation today is really structured in three parts. First, I'll provide a brief account of what I mean by black intellectual history, both methodologically and theoretically. Second, as the title suggests, I'll attempt to historically contextualize the political theory of race of a largely neglected thinker within South Africa's intellectual history, Sam Noluchungu. And lastly, perhaps the more substantive part of the presentation will focus on Noluchungu's important intellectual contribution to South Africa's histori historiography, and in particular to the question of race. I should also perhaps mention um, that this presentation is based on a recently accept accepted paper to the Journal of Comparative Political Theory, um, and it's going to be exceedingly difficult, given the 30 minute time limit, to collapse all the major parts um, of the paper into this talk. But those who are interested in reading a longer account can perhaps access the paper, um, which will be available for, uh, in, in the June issue. Okay, so uh, Humera, if you can just put on the first slide. Uh, oh, I can, now it's I can you. Uh, oh, yes. You're... Okay, sorry, got it. Okay. <laughs> So to begin, uh, something needs, needs to be said as regards the method of intellectual history and the manner in, it, in which it has been historically undertaken in South Africa. And here what I'm really provocating and what probably underpins the methodological component of this paper is, is the argument that while the discipline of intellectual history has been at the center of historical debates over meaning, context, hermeneutics, the relationship of thought and action and the explanations of historical change, and that one must study ideas not as abstract propositions, but in terms of the social, economic, and historical context that constructed it. And this is the argument that intellectual history is an underwritten subfield of South Africa's historiography. And for me, as a methodological point, this is instructive because it's linked implicitly to the manner in which intellectual history has been conceived of and theoretically undertaken in South Africa until the present day. So what I mean here by this is that the practice of the form and method of doing intellectual history with its sharp emphasis on individuals and sometimes institutions are expressed and contained in either hagiographical, biographical or socio-historical accounts and results in an almost complete disregard for the significance of texts and ideas which are so central to a critical and reflexive understanding of South Africa's fractious past and indeed even of the contemporary. And so to quote one of the conveners, Lawrence, who's not here, one of the existing, existing features of South African intellectual history is that there is a lack of understanding of the ideas and institutions that have been central to legitimizing or criticizing the colonial period and the apartheid and post-apartheid state. And the unintended political consequences of this phenomenon is its impact on economic development and on social redress. This is apparent, for example, in attempts to rectify past injustices such as land dispossession or even in confronting institutional racism in post-democratic South Africa. That's what I'm arguing for is a kind of genealogical account of the development of these ideas and institutions and the manners and the manner in which they reproduce racial power and privilege, which may help us to provide better mechanisms for equality and justice in post-colonial society. As Mahmoud Mamdani outlines, the reductionism of post-colonial debates often fails to consider how institutional features undermine democratic reform in that the colonial legacy, the institutional, remains more or less intact. So what I'm arguing for is, about, is for this retrieval of texts and ideas, which is a useful, if not critical, way of confronting the past and for providing context and knowledge of prevailing realities and in turn enab enabling a way of envisaging the future. This analysis also offers an instructive but urgent task. 
It's prompted by the judgment that, that if we're to succeed in creating a more accurate and complete sense of our present historical realities, we must engage with the epistemological and methodological foundations of intellectual history itself. And the contextual urgency in undertaking a project that is not merely seeking to establish the importance of black intellectual ideas, but doing so in order to reclaim these ideas, to give content and meaning to disputed and unsettled claims of justice, legitimacy, liberty, equality, and land rights in South Africa. Um, as the discourse of the negotiated settlement and reconciliation sparks intense debates, often resulting in greater forms of racial polarization, historical rumination and reflection offers a powerful and enduring opportunity for collective inquiry. Okay. Um, so th the following is, is an attempt to historically locate uh, Sam Nolotungu's ideas in the wider context of his texts and is a, an important interlocutor of debates during the, on race during the apartheid period. Um, and what, I've, what I'm providing you today is by no means an exhaustive overview. Um, I'm just going to quickly praise you a few points that will provide the context in which um, will come what, what is going to, to follow. So Sam Nolotungu is a, a black intellectual thinker that wrote during the, uh, during the apartheid period. His social and political milieu um, is a sig significant entry point for locating his ideas. He's born in April 90, 1945 um, in King Williamstown in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Um, and he receives his early training and education at the Lovedale Missionary School. And those familiar with South African history will know that the Lovedale Missionary School founded in 1824 by the Glasgow Missionary Society, served an influ influential role in the history and development of black education and leadership in South Africa. I mean, people famously like Nelson Mandela and others attended the school. Noluchungu later pursues a tertiary um, qualification at the historically black university Fort Hare, also in the Eastern Cape, and then moves on to pursue a scholarship opportunity at Keele University in the United Kingdom, working as a faculty member at different points at the universities of Ibadan, York in Toronto, Manchester, and finally um, at the University of Rochester in New York, where he remains until his untimely death. In a glowing tribute in the African Studies Association newsletter, Nolichungu is venerated as a Renaissance scholar with a vibrant intellect who overcame many obstacles to achieve high academic distinction. One of the arguments that I'm trying to make in trying to excavate Nolichungu's work is to emphasize his remarkable role as a Black intellectual thinker, professor, and theorist. Um, published material that singularly acknowledges the theoretical complexity of his ideas, the novelty of his approach, and the elegant artistry of his writing style are virtually non-existent. I think my paper will probably the, be the first one which, which really acknowledges this. In particular, uh, his scholarly contributions to South Africa's intellectual history have generally not received enough attention in the post-democratic context, even if he has cited variously in the, in the broader literature. The same is to be said of the inclusion of his writings in the university teaching cur curriculum across the country, where his work remains relatively obscure. So I'm going to now talk about the centrality of, of Nolichungu's ideas. The purpose of this paper is really to bring to light two of Nolichungu's contributions to the intellectual history of race. The first is with regards to his important theoretical exposition to the race and class debates which dominated discussions on political reform in South Africa from the 1970s onwards. And the second is in particular reference to the importance of his theoretical evaluation of the social and political significance of one of the principal forces of anti-apartheid resistance, the Black Consciousness Movement. Here, um, henceforth, I refer, I refer to the Black Consciousness Movement as BCM for, for purposes of brevity. The link between these two aspects of, of Nolichungu's thought might be con construed as being insig insignificant and perhaps even tangential. However, I seek to argue that Nolichungu's distinctive approach to political reform is enhanced when examined as an ac accompaniment to the extensive analysis of, of the Black consciousness and movement. In other words, for Nolichungu, social and political change was rooted in challenging racial domination and the political development of BCM most vividly illustrated why racial rather than class considerations were foremost on the agenda. BCM not only prioritized the question of race as a primary factor in its most mode of resistance, but served to elucidate 
how and why consequential change in South Africa hinged on the complete abolition of racial oppression and the overturning of the institutions of apartheid. For Nola Chingu, other strategies addressing class cleavages, such as the incorporation of black elites, resembled the tactics of counterinsurgency as opposed to fundamental reform. The substantive content of these ideas is contained in Nola Chungu's book, Changing South Africa Political Considerations, published in 1982. This book, written dur during a period of heightened political pressure against the apartheid establishment, offered a refined and clearly developed analysis on understanding apartheid South Africa, both in terms of the prevailing political and economic system, as well as the nature of its structural realities and the political terrain which conditioned it. It's thus hardly surprising that Nolichungu refers to his method as reflective, as much as the documented primary research in his book is complemented with careful and critical reflective insights. Nola Chungru describes this book as a, a three-part essay that attempts to undertake a theoretical analysis of what political change in South Africa would constitute in light of two major considerations. First, the objective material inequalities between blacks and whites, which impede the process of resolution insofar as it continues to be a process conducted by elite actors. And second, that an analysis for change ought to consider and appreciate black responses, in particular, political and ideological resistances to domination under apartheid, especially those black voices which favor radical change as the primary method of reform. Nola Chungu draws into sharp focus two currents of intellectual debate in South Africa's historiography. On the one hand is liberal and democratic thought, which Nola Chungu argues concerned itself with political change, but was fundamentally impeded by a realist impatience and a lack of theorization on what large scale social and political change would constitute. Similarly, Nola Chungu identifies the second dominant approach, Marxism, which although concerned with fundamental change, for Nola Chungu overstates an economic instrumentalist position, which is insufficient for addressing a range of important political questions. However, it's Nola Chungu's approach to the latter, which stimulates a series of important interventions in what can be described as the ongoing race class debates taking place in South Africa during this period. And so I'm going to turn to this now. The race class debates. And now we need to think about the race class debate before sort of debates around intersectionality and other kinds of things. So one of the many developments of South Africa's historiographical trajectory was the launching of a revisionist academic tradition in the 1970s, which invoked the basis of a Marxist framework to undermine its liberal adversaries. This period constituted the intellectual formalization of an enduring race class debate, most, fundally, most fundamentally concerned with whether race or class ought to be treated as the central analytical category underpinning the apartheid project. This debate drew in a significant number of intellectual contributors who sought to either privilege the concept of race or class and or their relationship between one another. Interestingly, there exists a striking amount of literature dedicated to debating the importance of the centrality of either race or class in the circles, circles of liberation party activism, for example, the African National Congress and the South African Communist Party, as well as within the academic realm. The South African Communist Party, for example, posited a thesis of colonialism of a special type, which viewed apartheid as, as a system of internal colonialism and argued that there existed no divide between the white colonizing power and the colonized black people as they lived in the same state. The SACP used the CST argument to subtly integrate the relevancy of the concept of race in the framework of class exploitation. The race cl class debate really gained traction in the early 1970s when the anti-apartheid activist and academic Harold Wolpe publishes a controversial but highly influential article entitled Capitalism and Cheap Labor Power in South Africa from Segregation to Apartheid in which he posited that a class analysis be considered as a central factor to understanding domination. Writing against the backdrop of both liberal ideas and those perspectives which excluded class from its analysis, Wolpe pro proceeded to offer something different and interesting. Wolpe's central thesis was that the apartheid system of domination and control depended less on a racially pernicious ideology and more on ensuring that cheap labor power is maintained. Wolpe, Wolpe therefore contended that South Africa's 
that the South African state served as a mere instrument of class rule in a specific form of capitalist society, and that racial discrimination was essentially the means for the reproduction of a particular mode of production. While we criticize prevailing historiographical approaches which lacked a class dimension, arguing that those uh, that these were misleading. He objected to the view that apartheid was a more developed form of segregation or a reflection of racist ideology, labeling these characterizations as simplistic. Instead, he presented a revisionist account of South African history that attempted to analyze apartheid from the perspective of class relations. Racist ideology, in his view, ought to be understood in terms of the specific economic context in which it produced. Moreover, he, Wolfe casts racial ideology and the types of political practice it sanctioned as, and I quote, complex, reciprocal, although asymmetrical relationship with changing social and economic conditions. Now, a number of black intellectuals, including Sam Noluchungu, wrote in response to Wolpe's cheap, a cheap labor thesis. Noluchungu stands out as a leading figure and his contribution to the race class debate, I argue ought to be properly appreciated. And this is something I, I try to foreground quite intensely in my paper. Nola Chungu's normative framework of analysis and the attention he pays to understanding the political dimension and the morphology of its alignments set, its work, set his work apart from descriptive accounts as well as those couched in crude economic reductionism. Nola Chungu perceived that many Marxist intellectuals ignored the critical racial dimension in their analysis of apartheid and, and that instances of resistance to domination and exploitation ought not to be viewed and I quote, as a form of fal false consciousness, but first and foremost, as reactions to the terms of domination itself. Noluchungu argued that Wolpe's view, which espoused that racial oppression was underlined by the dynamics of capitalist development and that what was occurring in South Africa was the outcome of an epiphenomenon of the class struggle was a misrepresentation of reality. He argued that race was critical to the narrative of political reform and that the terms of domination and submission were, cru were crucial. In particular, Noluchungu broke free from a dominant discourse of understanding political reform during this period by placing a measure of emphasis on racial domination in, in politics as a fundamental driving force of apartheid. As such, what Noluchungu does is he seeks to characterize what is meant by the term political by arguing that in the first place, it is a field that is distinctive in itself with, and I quote, relations and concerns, modes of behavior and values particular to itself discrete from something merely instrumental to economic ends or passively reflecting economic determinations. An indispensable aspect of knowledge in was political theory was the recognition of racial realities in an intellectual context where the class dimension of domination seemed to be given theoretical priority. Nolichungu viewed racism as a, sig as a significant reality and implied that re reducing it to a vehicle of capitalism ignored a key source of domination. The contention was simple. Those who experienced the daily dehumanizing experience of racial oppression under apartheid would be unconvinced by strategies of mere economic reform. Oppression for the vast majority of black South Africans was located in the ontological question of blackness and not in the structures of class exploitation, a claim that would at its essence deny their very experience. Um, and as such, uh, Noluchungu critiqued Marxist theories that did not take seriously the question of race, postulating that, um, postulating that Marxists, like liberals, tended to view black self-assertion with suspicion, unhappy about its apparent ideological re resonance with white racialism. This is because race domination, according to Noluchungu, and I quote, could not be reformed and concessions would not win over the dominated. Noluchungu's treatment of reform was later recognized by Wolpe in his book, Race, Class, and the Apartheid State, as one of the few available analytical texts on apartheid South Africa that attempted to deal explicitly with the structure and political terrain of conflict. For Noluchungu, the political terrain of conflict provide, provided a useful explanation both for white reluctance to fundamental reform as well as black radical responses. As such, interpretations such as Wolpe's class analysis were often, in his view, insufficient insofar as capturing the real political reality. But Nolo Chunglu explored this discussion in a subtle and nuanced manner, not merely discounting the impact of economics completely and arguing that the aim is not to place a political emphasis where others have stressed economics, but to understand how the political problem of securing relatively stable relations of dominance and submission that did not 
uh, rely directly or, or inordinately on force is integrally, um, integrally related to the very economic order. Thus, he argues, this is because these alignments are produced in politics. They're not devoid of economic context and usually bear implications on economic realities. In response to Nolotungu, Wolpe argued that the relationship between theory and practice should not be underestimated as theorizing apartheid as an exclusively racially based system would lead to problematic practical outcomes. Here, Wolpe was actually refer to, referring to what was often described as a simplistic identitarian form of politics, which was unable to transcend racial dis difference. But in particular for Wolpe, while the basic structure of apartheid society consisted of a dominant white group, and a dominated black group, class relationships ought to be considered in the overall theory of systematic oppression and reform should be sought on class lines. For Warpair, an overemphasis on race would result in the proliferation of political perspectives, such as black consciousness. Um, and and Warpair viewed the black consciousness movement um, as uh, emphasizing racial antagonisms and alliances. But Nolo Chungu, and I'm going to move to my next slide, which now really leads to, um, which talks about his analysis of, of BCM, envisaged that the Black consciousness movement would serve a different purpose for several reasons. First, he believed that the emergence of BCM as a resistance movement underscored that resistance to oppression in the face of brutal straight repression would be located in claims for Black self-determination and dignity. Second, that BCM's concern with the racial question was not, as Wolpe believed, about fueling racial tensions, but in effect about seeking substantive transformation and political change through the dismantling of apartheid institutions. Nolo Chingu's evaluation of the terms in which Black responses were framed, that is that they are commonly activated by political rather than economic conditions or understood through the tension between political domination as opposed to exploitation was crucial to the debate at the time. For Nolotungu, BCM's intensification of Black solidarity, which strengthened the project of Black resistance, made markedly clear that political reform e um, equaled the abolition of racial oppression. For, furthermore, apartheid institutions and, and policies which maintained and reproduced racial domination could be subverted if the racial question was given primacy. The, the desirable political objective for the vast majority of, of the oppressed was that the system was deracialized above everything else. So in part three of the book, A Changing South Africa Political Co Considerations, I argue that Nolo Chungu provides one of the most systematic and thorough theoretical reflections of the black consciousness movement that is to be found in any of the extant literature on the subject. So it might be appropriate to make a few observations here. First, that Nolo Chungu's focus on BCM does not signify that it was the only relevant response pattern against a system of racial domination and submission within South Africa. Rather, as he claims, the development of BCM symbolized black resistance insofar as its interaction with the state illustrated particularly well the tendencies towards nationalist militancy and social radicalism that popular movements amongst blacks invariably contained. Admittedly, Nolotungu's historical and interpretive method in presenting the development of the movement is particularly compelling in revealing the internal logic of the movement, its ideological and organizational ambiguities, its key philosophical imperatives, the success of its conscientization project, project and that Black oppositional responses were rooted in deliberately political rather than economic terms. In other words, Nolo Chungu foregrounded his theory of political reform by according rates its proper place, maintaining the significance of racial consciousness and action, not as mere peculiarities that universalist socialism or liberalism must in its wisdom educate and transform, but as inextricable to the political terrain of colonial heritage in South Africa, and as such as an integral component of the relation of domination and exploitation at the most fundamental level. And so Nolo Chingu successfully conveys to the reader how race, reform, and resistance were intertwined when considering the politics of South Africa during the late apartheid period. The specific mechanism for political re reform was located in structures of Black solidarity, such as BCM, which, based on the historical urgencies of the social and political context, formed formidable Black alliances that prioritized race over class. Ultimately, this would serve to illustrate the path in which freedom could be pursued. 
Um, the development of a radical current within BCM testified for knowledge Jumbo to the fact that there existed an inevitable trajectory in any effort to mobilize Blacks in nationally and confirmed the, imp the impossibility of the state of legitimizing itself to Blacks. As Nolochingo outlined, Black popular movements such as BCM were highly subversive of the apartheid establishment. And so Nolochingo's ideas, elegant and profound, enunciated the recognition and significance of racial realities that were at the forefront of political reform. Okay, so I'm now going to, um, how am I doing for time, Sarah? I'm just going to give you the 25 minute. Okay, um, so okay I think right, so I, I, I'm going to go into, I'm going to now sort of um, move on to my conclusion. Um, so I'm hopefully I'm doing well for time. Okay, so as a way of conclusion, and this is really the last part of my paper, um, again, for those who are interested in reading a much longer account, because this is really a brief sort of precede version of the, of the whole paper, um, it's going to be published in the Journal of Comparative Political Theories, June issue. Um, as a way of conclusion, I want to really briefly de deliberate on the contemporary relevance of Nolo Chingu's ideas and the manner in which his theoretical and historical arguments offer considerable opportunity for reflection um, and rumination on South Africa's present day realities. And here I really want to emphasize three important ideas. The first is with regards to Nolichungu's critique of liberalism, which was skeptical of claims that advanced the liberating power of capitalism. Nolichungu con contended that capitalism in South Africa, conditioned by existing colonial political institutions, was unlikely to deliver black material prosperity and political freedom for the vast majority of people. For Nolichungu, and I quote, reform from above faces a major problem of legitimation, a dual problem of ideology and politics, which is structural. There is no denying that these structural issues continue to manifest themselves, I argue, in deleterious ways, impacting on the quality of democracy and the attainment of proper political and economic freedom for many black South Africans today. In this way, Nola Chingu's insights offer new meaning to the political malaise confronting South Africans presently. Secondly is the overarching theme of Nolichungu's writings, which maintain that politics is critical for social change, since political relations condition the aspirant values of a society and the quality of political life, life itself. And here Nolichungu's concern uh, with the importance of theorizing politics underpinned by the concepts of race, linked to freedom, representation, domination, and self-government are ideas that must be continued, that must continue rather to be inter interrogated normatively in contemporary South Africa. I argue that they should, as Nolichungu suggested then, and as South Africans know now, not being ignored, distorted, or subjected to its abstraction or a limited economic view of social change. Politics is not an instrumentalist tool, nor does it stand outside the process that creates economic differences, satisfactions, and discontents. But as Nolichungo argued, it modifies those cleavages and their effects in distinguishable ways. And third, and perhaps most imp importantly, is the enduring legacy of settler colonialism, which, as Nolichungo noted, is most often expressed in racial terms as domination produces a hostile division between colonizer and colonized generating a persistent inequality of power relations long after the period of colonization. The effects of this, I argue, in a society like South Africa cannot be overstated. Beyond the political transfer of power, the process of development of class and labor relations, the reproduction of power, and the role of citizen and subject, to quote Mandani again, continues to be mired by questions of race. All three of these ideas underscore Nolo Chungu's considerable foresight in imagining what a post-apartheid decolonized order might look like. Indeed, they too demonstrate that Nolo Chungu's contribution to South Africa's intellectual tradition and the relative neglect of his ideas conveys the importance of political theory from Africa, both from the perspective of engaging with non-Western sources, but also from the perspective of being reflexively self-aware about the animating impulse of comparative political thought as a whole to engender greater engagement with non-Western thought and to bring these ideas to the attention of Western and non-Western audiences. Okay, thank you. Great, 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha. That was fantastic and such a nuanced and interesting uh, exposition of the thought of a thinker that, you know, certainly I wasn't familiar with. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd just like to open, uh, you know, the floor for questions and I'll take a look. Is there anybody who has their hands up? Um, but in the meanwhile, uh, I'd like to also ask, I mean, I, I, can't go back to the first slide now, but um, just in terms of the exposition that you provided, uh, I was wondering, um, and in fact, I don't have the date of when his demise was, oh, it's 1997. So he didn't live past, but he certainly lived for the uh, promulgation of the kind of post-apartheid constitution. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, if there was, uh, because it was a very particular constitutional formation exercise, uh, did he, uh, you know, what was his view as it was expressed at the time vis-a-vis -vis that constitutional formation exercise and his longer politics? Okay, so uh, sh uh, shall I respond to one question or take, um, let me respond to that and then maybe we can take them in groups. I'm actually just trying to stop sharing a screen. So I was a little bit distracted, but I'm <laughs> sorry. Is the screen still sharing? Um, it probably it is, is, yeah. Yeah, I'm just... But um, uh, what did she, um, you need to go back to is are you not in zoom just go back to zoom Aisha yeah, um, I am on zoom and it seems like I'm, I can't seem to locate the stop sharing button which was here a few minutes ago okay let me can you stop sharing it for me because I think we have uh, multiple people who are allowed just to, to um, yeah Great. Okay. Um, yeah, um, th that's actually an excellent question. Um, and so thank you for that, um, Sadaf. So, so Nalu Chungu did, um, you know, did, did live to see the, um, the, the onset of, of, um, of South Africa's democratic order in South Africa. In fact, um, the part of the paper, which I didn't really um, focus on, is the, the part of his um, biographical history, where he was then um, brought um, where he was actually headhunted to become the first black vice chancellor of um, uh, Wits University, which is um, one of the most prestigious um, intellectual institutions in South Africa. Um, and he initially accepts this, um, this position, but then later, later declines for, for health reasons and then dies uh, or passes away rather um, uh, a few months later in, in quite an untimely way because of, um, of a really aggressive form of cancer. Um, but if I, if I can remember, um, uh, and I can just sort of paraphrase what he said. He said that um, the views that it was, it was wonderful to see that the views that we held then um, become a reality now. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, 1990, between 1994 and 1997 um, was quite a short period from, uh, in which for him to really reflect on um, the nature um, of, of the kind of democracy that was going to, um, that, was, that was really taking place in South Africa. So he, on one hand, while he was quite optimistic, um, I think that um, this was during the tenure of, um, of the first sort of uh, democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela, where there was still quite a lot of optimism about, about South Africa and its future and its sort of newly found democracy, um, its uh, embrace of what was considered to be one of the most liberal constitutions um, amongst other things. Um, but, um, but as we know later, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in a wide, in a myriad of ways, many of these things were not materialized. And in particular, the kinds of material prosperities that he was so much um, concerned with um, during, the, um, the, during the later apartheid period, um, and, and which he theoretically reflected on quite a lot. Um, so, um, so I think if he were to be alive now, and a lot of people make this argument about Steve Biko and others who were quite, um, who, who were really, um, who had embraced the, you know, the black consciousness tradition and who were, who were fundamentally um, important figures of the black consciousness tradition, um, was that they would have been very disappointed um, with the trajectory that we had taken. Um, um, and, and so really, I think um, this is an important point to, to think about in relation to Tunala Chungu's own work. And also um, in, in, in reference to his critique of, of liberalism and, and Marxism. Thank you. Romero, you have a question? And anybody else, I guess, will take uh, a, a set of questions together. Um, so, Romero and then Michael Elliott, please. Thank you. 
Thanks, so that there's also a question in the chat that I can read out and then I have a question as well. I, I can read out that question. Um, so Aisha, the question in the chat says, do you agree that the apartheid regime deliberately conflated race and communism to restrict the support from Western nations to the black freedom struggle? So that's one question for you. Uh, and the question that I wanted to ask you Aisha was, uh, thank you very much for a really fascinating and rich uh, rich paper. Um, and there was a lot of a lot in it that uh, uh, that I would have loved to unpack a bit more. But let me just focus on one uh, question. So it seems that Narajungu really seems to draw a distinction between economics and politics. And from what I understood from your presentation, he seems to say class is economic, but race is political or within the domain of the political. How exactly is he defining the political? What does he mean by the political? And, um, and how does he explain this kind of sharp distinction between the economic and the political, which, in, which itself is uh, somewhat unusual for Marxist thinkers, right? So I, 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 I'm, uh, uh, I see that, or at least in, in, as you presented him, I understand Narajungu to be really expanding Marxism and Marxist thought, uh, which is what happened in the global south, right? Certain ideas, uh, mm -hmm. Marxist ideas were really reworked and expanded and made much more interesting and capacious uh, with the, in terms of debates within the context that I know of South Asia, but um, as you presented South Africa and, and we know from South America as well. But uh, it is unusual to have this kind of sharp distinction between the economic and the political drawn within the context of Marxist thought. So if you could uh, expand on that a bit. So really, it's an invitation for expansion. Thank you. OK, so sh is that? Um, should we take one more question? I'd, I'd, uh, I'd there mean, is another OK. So Michael Elliott, would you like to? Sorry, yes, I was just joining in properly. Hi, Aisha. Um, Hi, so Michael. thanks. <laughs> so um, I thought it was really interesting as well. So uh, mine's also in the realm of kind of invitations, but um, I was just wondering if you could speak a bit more to the role of land um, and also in the context of settler colonialism, maybe um, if the terminology of territory is also there Sorry, in uh, I'm not what sure if it's really me. Is it just my connection? Ooh. Oh no, am I breaking up? Like, yeah, I, I didn't, sorry, uh, Michael. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll try again. Can you hear me now? Um, Maybe my mic's not I, working very well. I, 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 I didn't hear any of your question. I mean, I'm not sure if it's I'll only type in chat. I'll type I can, in chat. I can hear. Can um, sorry, I don't want so to. I can repeat the question if you, Aisha, can you hear me? Um, yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, you can't hear me. Okay, well, I could hear Michael, so I can um, pose the question if you want to repeat it, I, and or or if you want to type it into the chat box, whichever. I'll try just saying it once more, uh, like hopefully it come through this time. So no, I was just wondering if you could speak to the role of uh, land and maybe the language of territory as well in, in Nolichindu's um, critique, um, especially kind of like thinking in, in the line of the critique of settler colonialism and that aspect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I did hear that the second time. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Michael. Um, sorry. Um, so thank you for those um, really rich and, and and fascinating set of questions. And I I doubt I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be able to do justice to all of them because um, I really have so much to say. But also, um, I'm I'm not sure if um, I, some of them will require for me to 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 think about them much more um, and um, and give it um, a lot more reflective thought. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question that was in the chat box, but I, 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 mean, I noted it, I hope I got it, um, you know, I was able to, to get the gist of the question. Um, and it was really about whether there was a deliberate attempt to conflate economics or, or this class analysis um, uh, during the apartheid period. So this, this idea of communism and race. Um, am, am I correct, Humira? In, 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 in that... Um, Okay, um, and I suppose my way of, of replying to that is that um, I'm actually not sure. I mean, I can't tell whether there was this deliberate attempt or not and, and to what extent what people's intentions were when they were sort of uh, debating intellectually and in, in, in other spaces around these 
particular questions of, of, of race and class. But I think there was a genuine uh, concerted effort to try and um, underpin um, and try to understand what were some of the central analytical categories in, in which we could, in which apartheid could be um, understood and, and sort of interrogated. Um, and so, um, and from my reading of, um, of many black intellectuals, um, it seems as if this, this notion of race really features strongly in their work. Um, and this perhaps also comes into um, to, to, um, the second question, which is, uh, what, what Homero is talking, um, Homero's question around whether class and economics can be collapsed uh, into one category and whether for knowledge of politics um, and race were, were, were sort of collapsed into one category. And, and this, this seems to be the case in both my reading of Nolichungu and also of other thinkers such as Bernard Ungobani and others, um, other black intellectuals who wrote during that time. Um, and the, the argument that, that, that I try to make is that, um, what, what black intellectuals were really seeking to, um, uh, to sort of state in their writings was that um, the, the, the idea of race could not be ignored as a key source of domination um, in, um, and, 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 that, and that class should just be, be, be given priority. Um, and so this is why, you know, um, although Harold Wolpe's work is given so much of traction in, in South Africa's historiography. I mean, it's almost impossible to read anything about apartheid without referencing his work even today, uh, because he's such a sort of seminal thinker. Um, people like Nolichungu's work has, has been given less um, sort of prominence because they, they tended to undermine and, and, and to critique people like Walpe who, who espoused that um, that racial oppression was just underlined by the dynamics of capitalist development and that what was occurring in South Africa was this sort of epiphenomenon of a class struggle. And I think these were the kinds of debates that were happening, as Humira rightfully pointed out, in, um, in many parts of the global South during this, this time. There was this, you know, the indigenous writers who, uh, who believed that this was a misrepresentation of reality. And so Nolichungu breaks free from this sort of dominant discourse of, of thinking about political reform in this way um, by, by placing this emphasis on, on racial domination as this fundamental part of apartheid. Um, and then Romero asked me a really important question about um, how did Nolichungu attempt to define the political? Um, um, and here I'm going to actually quote him because I think it's, it's without, I don't want to do injustice to what he meant, but. Um, what he meant by the term political is that it is a field that is distinctive in itself with relations and concerns, modes of behavior and values particular to itself, discrete from something merely instrumental to economic ends or passively reflecting economic determinations. So, I mean, he, I mean obviously embedded in that sort of definition of what, what the political meant, um, and this is different from Schmidt and others, is this, is this really sort of important and fascinating um, you know this, this idea of power amongst other things but that um it is um it's about modes of behavior and about kind of values and, and that kind of stuff okay um and then to the last question again i'm sorry if i've i've um mishandled these questions in any way is the um, is michael's fascinating question on the role of land and territory which is something that um i bring up in the concluding part of my paper um and michael um so Nolichungu doesn't directly um, unpack and um, analyze and write about what the role of land uh, would be in a post-democratic context and what the role of land is. So, so that's just um, sort of the first point to, um, to kind of uh, to remember. Uh, but he does refer to the notion of settler colonialism at, at various points. Um, but in particular relation to the manner in which settler colonial, uh, colonialism and, it, and its legacies, it's in particular, its institutional legacies, continue to, pr to uh, proliferate and to reproduce themselves in different ways um, in, um, um, in, in post-colonial societies and the, and the ways in which we can think about that. So, um, and, and that's really uh, one of the points that I was kind of trying to make at the end where he, um, and this is something that I want to, um, as I sort of delve into his work uh, more, um, perhaps um, write about. I mean, it gives me an exciting idea for another paper. Uh, but this this idea of settler colonialism as it's, as a category on its own, and and how Nolichungu de dealt with that. 
um, but he believes that settler colonialism has an enduring legacy um, in post-colonial societies and that um, it is most, uh, and that its effects are most acute and expressed in, in racial terms, right? Uh, because domination is about uh, producing this hostile division between colonizer and colonized. And what settler, what, what settler colonialism for Nolichungu does is that it generates this persistent inequality of power relations long after the period of colonization has ended. And I guess um, those who are here for, um, from the South African audience and from other parts of the global South will, will probably attest to the fact that those of us who are um, um, who, who, who observe some of the, the, the occurrences of the post-democratic um, order um, that set settler colonialism in its pernicious and insidious form continues to bear a very enduring legacy, which is why we have so many un um, unresolved issues around um, racial redress and transformation. Um, and of course, the, I mean, I brought up the issue of land rights and territory, um, but I haven't investigated it in, in detail in, um, in Olochungu's work, but it will give me the opportunity to, um, to do that. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've, we have a few more minutes. So if there are any further questions, um, please uh, put your hands up. But there's a, a sort of a train of, um, you know, thinking to sort of, I wanted to uh, ask, further to the question um, or the invitation that Humera presented. What's interesting to me, uh, insofar as the kind of resonances that you see across the Global South and answering back to the kind of nationality question within Marxist theorizing, uh, is that much of the intervention was undertaken when you had rising nationalisms, and those were either ethno-linguistic nationalisms or religious uh, you know, nationalisms. Um, so I wonder, in a sense, I mean, I'm asking this because, of course, uh, in the context that, uh, you know, you're speaking about uh, somebody who um, was feeding the Black consciousness movement, what what is the place, I mean, is there a kind of Black nationalism? Uh, is there a kind of racialized, uh, you know, of course it's it's a fight against structures of domination uh, on, uh, on many parameters, but I want to sort of, again, this is an invitation to speak a bit more about what the interiority of that kind of Black consciousness for um, Nolu Shungu was, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, sure, that does. Um, shall I shall I respond to that, or are there any other questions? Um, I don't see anybody else right now, so I, I guess if that would be all right. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, that that's really an excellent question. Uh, thank you, Sadaf. So um, so the the reason I um, one part of my paper or component of my paper really um, attempts to undertake understanding how um, Noluchungu sort of uh, thinks about and writes about and analyzes the black consciousness movement because it's because that he was writing during a time when when black consciousness movement um, was was um, quite visible on the political South African stage. Uh, many of the other um, political and liberation party movements were either in exile or operating underground. Their figures um, were incarcerated and imprisoned, um, and, they, and the, the kind of uh, mobilization of these were, 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 were impeded in significant ways. Um, and so um, Nolichungu is writing at a time when, you know, Black consciousness starts to take um, starts to take center stage in South Africa. We know with the 1976 riots, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's strong assertions with those who write about um, those Soweto riots that it was actually BCM, which had a, a huge role to play in actually activating the, those uh, resistance and um, responses, et cetera. Um, and this is why he spent such a large part of his book really uh, providing the systematic and sort of uh, thorough theoretical reflection on, on black consciousness. Um, Absolutely, he refers to black concert, black the, the BCM as a um, nationalist um, militant um, organization, a popular movement, etc. Um, and he talks about how we need to think about it uh, from the perspective of black resistance um, and 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 what that means. Um, he 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 starts off by saying that black consciousness was not the only sort of um, response, black resistance response, but that it was one that took seriously 
the idea of racial domination. It made that foremost to its political project. We know it was all about black conscientization, black man you on your own was one of the famous kind of symbols of um, uh, of the black consciousness movement. We know people like Steve Biko, who, who was um, the head of the BCM at the time, or one of its, you know, important kind of agents, um, argued that, um, that it was all about sort of uh, reconscientizing uh, black people to believe in their sense of agency and their kind of emancipatory, liberatory power in order to sort of overcome this system of domination, which really begins um, in the psychological realm. Um, and so he, um, what he does is that he, in this, in this particular chapter is he evaluates BCM in this kind of really compelling way. Um, first, he, he, he tries to reveal what is the internal logic of the movement, um, what are some of the ambiguities of the movement. And one of the ambiguities of the movement is, is it a nationalist movement? Is it a militant movement? Um, is it, uh, what, is it, what is its stance on violence? What is, it, what is its stance on, um, on some key philosophical imperatives? In fact, he um, analyzes BCM from the lens of class. I mean, to what extent did Marxism and socialism, African socialism, the works of Nerere and others impact um, its, um, its uh, own kind of ideological and, um, formation and, and sort of thinking? Um, and then he goes on to um, evaluate the success of its conscientization project, which is what it goes, um, I mean, its conscientization project is really aimed at, at the masses of people in, in the township areas, et cetera, um, who, um, who are most sort of, in his view, kind of affected by the everyday dehumanizing kind of indignities of apartheid. Um, and then, um, and, 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 and so, um, he and then he eventually argues, and this is why I try, this is the part of the paper where I try to link um, to his sort of um, I try to link black his analysis of BCM and and that and his sort of conception of the importance of race is that um, BCM is an instance of how political reform, resistance, um, and race can be intertwined um, because it maintains the significance of racial consciousness and action. Um, and it's not really about, um, you know, integrally, it's really about um, it, that if domination and exploitation is going to be defeated at the most fundamental level, um, the whole system needs to be de-racialized. And, and black, uh, you know, black consciousness was a good example of that. And perhaps these debates are still kind of occurring in, in the current kind of discourse for those who, um, how shall I describe them in, 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 the, in the current sort of political landscape in South Africa seem to consider Mandela's reconciliation project a kind of sellout to the, um, the real, um, the cause of independence and democracy. And one of the reasons for this is because it fails to really deliver uh, black material prosperity. It fails to deliver the you know, proper emancipation. And, and, and genealogically, many, many thinkers in the contemporary are linking that back to what they, what they in the black radical tradition rather, are, are linking that back to what they describe as the charterist tradition. The idea that the ANC in, um, in, um, in contrast to, um, to, to the black consciousness movement openly adopted a, um, uh, a charterist position, what was considered as the Freedom Charter, which was a system of non-racialism. Um, whereas there were other movements at the time, like the PAC and Black, Consci Black Consciousness, which were more identitarian and, and focused much more strongly on the question of race. And, and had that um, sort of surfaced and permeated more into the, uh, into the kind of political landscape and had they, those actors had more, had more power and agency during the re reconciliation position. Um, the idea, I mean, the, the, the argument is that we would have had a very different outcome. Thank you so much. So there was one question which I'm going to read out, but I think we have to cut off after that. So um, this is from Ben Allard, who's written, uh, well, offered that you should feel free to ignore if you do not have time or if not relevant. Um, but you have observed significant continuities between pre-colonial and early colonial thought and apartheid uh, have you, sorry, sorry, have you observed significant continuities between pre-colonial and early colonial thought and apartheid era 
scholar is like Nilit Um And I think, uh, yeah, so that was uh, a last question. I don't know whether you want to take a, a quick um, stab at that, but I will also just say thank you very much. Thank you to all the participants. Um, and thank you, Aisha, for uh, giving this fantastic talk. And hopefully everybody else would keep coming back for uh, more in this series as is advertised on my site. But I'll let you have the last words on that, Aisha. Thank you. So yes, uh, thank you so much, Sadaf and, and Homera for the invitation. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so, uh, it was a really incredible opportunity to, um, to, uh, to be here and to engage with, um, with all the participants. Okay, so um, Ben, I'm gonna try to give a shot at your question. <laughs> it's gonna be quite difficult for me to, again, um, I'm thinking here on my feet. Yes, I have observed um, continuities, um, but in different ways, and I can't really unpack that now, but I think the one thing that I want to sort of emphasize um, is and um, is this disputed distinction uh, between the colonial and apartheid period. So um, my view is um, following from um, a sort of current concerted effort amongst black intellectuals um, in, in, the, in, in the current period is to oppose the existing intellectual tradition in South Africa, which distinguishes between the two historical phenomenon in a bifurcated ma manner and without a proper acknowledgement of the colonial conquest which predates apartheid. So one of the, one, and, and what I mean by this is that apartheid as a historiographical category um, without proper acknowledgement of the colonial context which comes before it um, uh, is just a new subtle and dif differentiated form um, uh, often described as hyper-apartheid or neo-apartheid. Um, and so really what I mean by this is that th there's often a disregard for those who are working in, um, um, in current sort of trying to understand intellectual history of, of, of South Africa's past is to disregard the colonial con uh, conquest of South Africa's historia historiography um, because many black intellectuals argue that um, sort of segregation and colonialism, which became before apartheid, was really the main problem in South Africa. By the time apartheid appears in 1948, title to territory and sovereignty over it had established itself as a major problem. And so the elimination of apartheid solved the problem only by conferring um, sovereignty over the indigenous conquered people, but the elimination of apartheid was not an answer to some major issues. Um, the question of the reversion of unencumbered and unmodified sovereignty um, and uh, questions of law, morality, and humanity. And so um, this is, this goes to the heart of the current sort of constitution that we have today, that um, the theoretical foundations of South Africa's constitution really um, sort of are in response to what occurred from 1948 onwards and doesn't deal with one of the major issues, which is what happens during um, the colonial conquest. And this is why the question of land has become such a major issue, because the major dispossession of land occurred during the colonial period rather than the, than the apartheid period. So, but, but these to continue and the, the fluidity of these ideas are obviously quite fascinating, but yeah, um, sorry, I'm, I, if I, if I was a bit um, inarticulate yeah, in my response, sense. anyway, but yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, for attending the, um, the lecture and it was, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, and um, I hope to, to attend the rest of the series. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.